Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Back when this podcast was starting, the very first episode I brought to the table was from The Price of Fear, a BBC series that began with a limited run in 1973. The production's popularity warranted a second run of shows in 1974, and a third that aired in 1983. Of course, what made The Price of Fear so special was the show's star, Vincent Price. By this point, Price was a well-established horror icon thanks to a series of filmed adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe stories, directed by Roger Corman. But long before that, he had a full career on the radio, including appearances on Suspense and Escape. He notably portrayed the title character of The Saint from 1947 to 1951. During each episode, Price played a slightly fictionalized version of himself, a globe-trotting gourmand and devotee of the arts who just happens to continually find himself wrapped up in macabre situations. This particular episode, The Man Who Hated Scenes, featured a performance by another horror film icon, Peter Cushing. Before destroying Princess Leia's home planet of Alderaan as Grand Moff Tarkin, Peter Cushing was a star of television, radio, stage, and film. He appeared in a variety of Hammer horror films, playing such roles as Van Helsing, Dr. Frankenstein, and Sherlock Holmes. He also starred in Doctor Who and the Daleks and Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. This story was adapted for radio by William Ingram from a story written by Robert Arthur, who is known for his award-winning work on The Mysterious Traveler and Murder by Experts. The story was originally titled The Hint under the pseudonym J. Norman. It appeared in issue number four of Mysterious Traveler magazine in 1952, 20 years prior to its broadcast as The Man Who Hated Scenes from the Price of Fear on September 29th, 1973. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music and listen to the voices. The Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Train trips fascinate me. How about you? If the answer is yes, then this story, which I have chosen to call The Man Who Hated Scenes, might well appeal to you. Indeed, for some of you listening, even the notion of making a long train journey across the United States will conjure up a world of limitless possibilities. The world seems yours for the asking. Right from that first whistle blow, right from the first shudder as the giant locomotive grips the tracks and pulls its human cargo away from the commonplace and the familiar towards the romantic and the unknown. Others of you, of course, might prefer to regard such a journey as simply a a respite, a period of temporary seclusion, a chance to simply sit and think. My own inclinations vary, and I suspect come somewhere in between. In any event, be it in the diner of a train speeding across the States or in the kitchen of my own home, I have always considered conversation at breakfast as something of a chore. And so it was, as I watched the little man coming towards me, my feelings were a mixture of resentment and dismay. His voice proved as tentative and deferential as his general demeanor. You, um... You won't mind if I share your table? The fact that the rest of the diner was still completely empty and the stranger seemed perfectly prepared for me to refuse ultimately made no difference to my polite reply. Will you 
Oh, no, please do. I'd be glad for the company. Oh, many thanks. Insomnia. Don't you know, I've been a martyr to it all my life. Oh, I'm sorry mm. about that. But still, it's nice to know I'm not going to be the only one coming in for breakfast this early. Oh? Yes, when I came in a few minutes ago, the dining car attendant looked as though he'd just got out of his pajamas <laughs> and could certainly see no reason why I wasn't still in mine. That he... He wasn't angry, was he? Well, let's just say not your usual service with a smile. I see. You must forgive my asking. It's just that I could perfectly well come back later if it were more convenient for them. Well, there's no point in making a scene, is there? I do so hate scenes. He glanced nervously away as the same sleepy waiter approached us from the service area. He gave his order in an apologetic, hardly audible voice. Just coffee and lightly scrambled eggs, please. Are you going all the way to New York? Hmm? Oh, much further, much further. I'm travelling on the QE2. We embark on Thursday. Oh, home to England, then. Oh, no, no, not for a long time yet. Uh, Cherbourg first, then the sun, the Riviera, perhaps, Italy, the Greek islands. I haven't made up my mind. Oh, I do envy you. Then you shouldn't. No? No, it's just a case of doctor's orders... It's my nerves, you know. It's any kind of excitement to be avoided at all costs. Yes. Yes, I do understand. I think you really do. For some unknown reason, I'm, I'm sure you do. So, my, my friend, you can imagine the kind of state I got myself into when I discovered my wife was being unfaithful to me, can't you? Your... your wife? Uh, Marilyn... So beautiful, so very, very beautiful. Oh, but perhaps you'd care to judge for yourself. I just happen to have... It. It's only a snapshot, but it doesn't do her justice, really. But, oh, yes, here, here we are. It was taken at the side of the pool, don't you know? Our pool. It's very impressive. <laughs> Marilyn loved that pool. I'd accepted and studied the photograph. The sleepy waiter had returned and was grudgingly serving my companion's breakfast. Yes, the girl was certainly beautiful. There was no denying that fact. Even though the photographer had caught her just on the point of emerging from the pool, her charms were not only obvious, but a trifle too obvious. The high diving board framed her head. <laughs> It reminded me somewhat disconcertingly of a gallows. I ordered scrambled eggs, didn't I? What? Yes. Yes, I'm sure you did, but they've brought you fried. So bad for the digestion, don't you know? Oh, well, these things are sent to try us. Oh, nothing of the kind. I'll ring for the service. No, no, please don't. I do so hate scenes, you see. Please... Well, just as you wish. Thank you. I suppose it's fortunate for me. I've never been short of money. It really is a wonderful insulator, old man. It protects me from all kinds of anxieties the average man can't avoid. It's probably why I've never objected when I've been overcharged or anything like that. Far easier to pay up. Remain calm. Hmm? Mm. You, uh... You were telling me about your... your wife. Marilyn. Oh, yes. Beautiful. So beautiful. The most beautiful creature I've ever seen, or I'm ever likely to see. I, I thought so right from the very beginning. Where was that? Mm -hmm. oh, it was at a resort in Florida. She was a swimmer before our marriage. Almost made the Olympic team. Did she really? Yes, really. Anyway, she was doing some exhibition dives from the high board into the hotel pool. She was wearing a white bathing suit. I remember seeing her poised high above me. She seemed a positive goddess incarnate. Diana turned mermaid instead of huntress. Uh, does that... Um, Sound f fanciful? No. No, not at all. 
I didn't think it would. To you? I, I never thought I was in with much of a chance, though. She was a, a good 20 years younger and always in the company of half a dozen bronzed Apollos. But, well, we just seemed to hit it off right from the start. The difference in age didn't seem to matter. <laughs> Uh, a case of mind over matter. I, I suppose you could put it like that. In any event, within a month, Marilyn and I became husband and wife and were off on our honeymoon. We were so very happy. And afterwards, you you returned home. A home? It's a, it's a big Spanish type of place just outside Santa Barbara. A truly beautiful spot. I don't think I ever wanted to leave that house ever again. It gave me the seclusion and peace my nerves required. I had everything I ever wanted. Mm. And uh, Marilyn? Oh, for a long time she loved the place too. We'd splash about in our pool every day and often I'd just lie in the sun and watch her diving. Mm. And <laughs> sometimes... Yes. Well, sometimes we'd send the servants away for the day and... Uh, if you'll pardon the expression, we'd swim in the nude. <laughs> well, it was genuinely idyllic, my friend. In an age when all the graciousness seems to have gone out of life. Idyllic. So much so that when it finally came, Marilyn's outburst took me completely by surprise. What's so surprising about it, for God's sake? And you needn't think I'm so dumb as to not realize what you're getting out of this setup either. Getting out of getting, this setup? Getting, yes. This place, miles from anywhere, perched on the edge of nowhere. Well, it exactly suits your ends, doesn't it? I thought you liked the house. A rich, eccentric, middle-aged recluse, comfortably ensconced in his twenty-bedroomed ivory tower. I've always felt you shared my preference for the solitary life. But not the godforsaken. <laughs> I don't understand what you're getting at, Marilyn. Don't you? Really? For a gentleman of your intelligence and breeding, I should have thought it altogether too obvious. However, I'll tell you. It's quite simple. Marilyn, yeah, do you think you ought to drink so much? You didn't have the guts to stay on here and go it completely alone. So, for once in his life, one hermit ventured forth. He took a little trip into the big outside world with the deliberate intention of trapping a little spouse to keep him company. I've never thought of our marriage as a trap. Ego being what it is, I'm damn sure you haven't. <sighs> but take it from me, it was just an arrangement right from the start. An arrangement no. to suit your own ends. I always tried to put your happiness first. Huh. Happiness. That's a word from the past. But I've given you everything you've ever asked for. Everything. I'll grant you the bait was acceptable enough at first. Bait? Of the very finest quality. There's no denying. But bait, Harry. You made the whole arrangement seem irresistible, didn't you? But uh... the world was to be our oyster, remember? New places, new faces, forever and ever, world without end. Amen. Ah, oh, you really had me believing it, too. Right up to the end of the honeymoon, you actually had me believing it. And afterwards? Well, the honeymoon was over, wasn't it? So was the new faces, new places routine. And in its place, this. A cage, damn you. Oh, well up to the standard you taught me to expect. I'm not denying, but a cage for all that. Madeline... I love you, right from that first moment. You knew that you wanted me, so you wooed me and you won me. You moved me into your millionaire's Alcatraz and then you throw away the keys. I still love you. Oh, maybe you do. Enough to go back? Back where? To where the arrangement started going wrong. To our original arrangement, Harry. New places, new faces, forever and ever world without end. It is not an arrangement. It never has been. It still is. And shall I tell you something else? It's never going to be anything more, Harry. <laughs> poor Harry. <laughs> poor, poor Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Some more coffee. Oh, thank you. 
So, uh, she got her own way, then? New places, new faces. If it had been in my power, she would have... She would have got her way. If it had been in my power, I'd have given her anything. Knowing what a person is doesn't necessarily mean you stop loving them, does it? No, I suppose not. So, um, you left the house? Hmm? Oh, no. No, it never came to that. Oh, it was, it, it was what Marilyn had insisted upon and what I'd agreed to. A really long trip abroad. A chance for us to find each other again. Extraordinary how absolute naivety has a charm of its own. But as things turned out, it simply wasn't to be. Oh? Well, on the eve of our departure, I was taken ill. Desperately ill. As a... as a result of the quarrel? Well, my doctor called it acute emotional stress... You you see, I've never been able to stand scenes of any kind, and in this case, well, my only defense was a period of total mental withdrawal, a self-inflicted coma, if you like. It went on for a long time, over a month. And then? It refused to go on any longer. Did, well, did Marilyn stand by you? Marilyn? Ah, yes, Marilyn. Marilyn. Marilyn? 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 It's all right. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, dear God. Marilyn? Easy now. You've been ill, Harry. Very ill. Yes. Yes, I, I have been ill, haven't I? So sorry, Marilyn. Oh, shush, shush. The only important so thing now is that you get well again. The doctor's been very worried for you. And you? Did you worry for me too, Marilyn? Oh, yes. I worried. Oh, thank you. Thank you for worrying. Oh, shh. No. No, you were quite right. I, I've been selfish and thoughtless, thinking only of myself. But I'll... I'll make it up to you. You'll see, I'll I'll make it all up to you. Of course you will. By simply getting well again. Yes, that's it. Well again. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then we'll make that long trip together, eh? Just the two of us. Just just as we've planned to do. No. Pardon? There's not going to be any trip, Harry. Not just yet. Not for a long, long time. Um, but uh, I thought that was what you, you, you wanted. It was. Well? And then you became sick. And I realized I wanted something else much more. I, I wanted you to get well again. So that we could always be together. Together here, Harry. I wanted this place for just the two of us. I wanted to look after you and care for you here in our own home, Harry. And I decided that the most important thing in the world for me was to make it into a real home. Not some kind of show place. Mm-hmm. Not some kind of domestic hotel either, where everything gets done for you at the press of a button. I'm, I'm not sure I understand. But... It's perfectly simple. I got rid of the servants, Henry. The servants? You... We never really needed them. Don't you see? It was they that came between us, Harry. Our only real happiness came when we were allowed to be alone together. But how are we going to manage with that? Easily, easily, easily. I've already arranged it all and it's working wonderfully. A woman comes up from town every morning to take care of the heavy work. I can get anything we need by making a phone call and having it delivered. Well, what more do we need? What more can we ask, huh? Nothing, my love. Nothing. Just the two of us. Just the two of you. And tell me, did it work out like that? No. No, not quite like that. Well, uh, how? As the weeks went by and I got steadily stronger, Marilyn thought the occasional change of scene might speed my recovery. Nothing too 
far afield, mind you, nothing too taxing, just a little jaunt along the coast, the odd picnic in the hills. Well, my nerves being what they are, I've never felt confident enough to drive myself, and Marilyn didn't really feel up to it. We had got rid of my old chauffeur, along with the rest of the staff, and so... So you engaged another one? Marilyn engaged one. His name was Charles. I had no objection to her choice. My own newfound happiness was such that I was scarcely aware of him. What was he like? Charles? Mm. Oh, he was in his mid-twenties, I suppose. I dare say handsome, in an obvious sort of way. But, as I say, I was, I was hardly aware. Not until that night. The night when... Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Dear God. God. That night is still with me. I I woke up with a start from a, a very deep sleep. Hmm. Marilyn had taken care to give me my usual quota of sleeping pills, but for some reason on this particular night, they hadn't done the trick. Perhaps it was meant... Well, for several minutes I just lay there, perspiring heavily, getting my bearings, aware only of the ticking of the clock. Then I called out for Marilyn. Yes, I, I didn't want to disturb her, but I, I needed another sedative badly. But when she didn't answer, I, I, I got up and went to her room. She, she wasn't there. At first I thought she must have got up for something too. Until I saw her bed hadn't been slept in. It was almost four o'clock in the morning. I was a little alarmed, so I, I, I began to look for her. M Marilyn? Marilyn? It wasn't until I reached the downstairs living room, which opens onto the patio, that I heard voices. <laughs> I opened the patio doors. The voices were clearer now. My wife and our chauffeur, together at the pool. I understood at once. It was pitch black, and they'd taken the precaution of not turning on the pool light. But I could hear them laughing and talking in low, intimate voices. I heard them climb the steps to the high board and dive together into the deep water. I stood there, heart sick. The effort to simply hold on to myself was unbearable. My first instinct had been to rush out and confront them, but I, I couldn't bear the thought of such a scene. Uh, so instead, I, I waited until they eventually left the pool. They lay together in each other's arms, not ten feet from where I stood. I... listened. Why did you ever leave me? Oh, I don't know. I did then. At the time, it seemed the only possible answer. But I know I never stopped loving you, not for a single second. Which, in a funny way, is why I had to leave you in the first place. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Let's just say an instinct, shall we? Instinct? Yeah. And the kind of life we were living together must one day have killed that love. It wasn't so bad. Wasn't it? Diving exhibitions at second-rate summer resorts, the odd gala. Hardly enough to keep body and soul alive. Endless drag from one dreary hotel room to the next. So you sold out and settled for this instead. Oh. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to sound like that. I settled for both of us, Chuck. Oh, but you still don't know whether to believe that or not, do you? To believe that I only ever wanted this for us. All along. I don't know what to believe. When I'm lying here with you like this, well, 
It's just a sharing you with him, I suppose. Seeing you together. Catching the odd, unexpected glimpse of you both in that damn driving mirror. Oh. Seeing him look at you that way, as though you were really his. Seeing him reach out to touch you. Chuck. Seeing you smile back. Seeing you return the touch. Please but don't. worst of all, knowing that though you're lying here with me now, in a little while you'll be gone. Because there's still some part of you that belongs to him. Not belongs. It never has. It never can. It, it never will. I wish I could be sure of that. He's a sick man, Chuck. Sicker than he even suspects. A year, two years, a little longer, maybe. But it's not so important, is it? We can wait. Because we know that one day there's only going to be us, Chuck. All this and us. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Hold me. Hold me close. What did you do? Do? Mm. Oh, the conventional thing, I'm afraid. The next day I engaged a firm of detectives. To make inquiries about Charles. Mm. They only told me what I more or less knew already. That he was a swimmer who teamed up with Marilyn to do exhibition diving the summer before I met her. The rest was obvious. When I became ill, she had sent for him to solace her loneliness, shall we say. Then, as I grew better, she stumbled on the idea of employing him as our chauffeur. You can understand my dilemma. Yes, yes, I, I am beginning to. I was just recovering from a serious nervous illness, a breakdown, a scene, a quarrel would undo the weeks of convalescence. Now, of all times, it was impossible for me to have it out with Marilyn, to send Charles packing, to do what any other man would have done instantly. It was a weakness, but I couldn't overcome it. So? I dissembled. I pretended I knew nothing. I waited. I racked my brains for some way of letting Marilyn know that I knew, and yet avoiding that inevitable scene. Well, did you eventually find a way? Oh, yes. I saw how it could be done. Quietly, without any fuss. Tell me about it. Oh. Well, Marilyn wanted to go to the movies in Santa Barbara. I declined, but said Charles should drive her as I didn't like her to be out on her own at night. She... she saw me to bed and watched me ostensibly taking my sleeping tablets. I heard the car drive away and imagined handsome Charles, Chuck, sitting confidently beside her at the wheel. And after a while, I... I got up. I had plenty of time. Plenty of time for what? To arrange the hint. The hint that would let them know when they got back that I was fully aware of what was happening between them. Oh, go on. It was well after midnight when they got back. Very dark. A hot, sultry night. Just the night for a swim. Marilyn didn't even come up to her room but went with Charles directly to his. And a few minutes later I heard them laughing softly as they came out and went towards the pool... It was inky dark, but I knew they were climbing the diving tower. The high board creaked as they stepped out onto it, and creaked again sharply as each one dived off into the pool. Marilyn first, then Charles right behind her. Their little game they enjoyed so much. It was too dark to see a foot in front of you. But, of course, to swimmers of their skill, it made no difference. In fact, I, I rather imagine it added to their fun. And uh, your hint, did it work? I, I, I mean, did it break up the affair? Oh, yes. It broke up all right. The affair ended that very night. A truly effective hint, when I finally thought of it. You see, my friend, that evening, as soon as they had left the house, I opened each of the four valves and drained all the water out of the swimming pool. Mm. Mm. 
The man watched me. Waited. I could think of nothing to say. After what seemed an eternity of silence between us, the train entered a tunnel. It was like the fall of a curtain. That was Vincent Price, bringing you the last in this series, The Price of Fear. Also starring in The Man Who Hated Scenes was Peter Cushing with Diana Olson and Steve Preston. The Man Who Hated Scenes was first recounted by Robert Arthur, dramatized by William Ingram, and produced by John Dias. That was The Man Who Hated Scenes from The Price of Fear here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was Tim's pick. Yes. Uh, Tim is a huge fan of Mr. Price, loves Vincent Price. I have huge moments where I love Vincent Price and huge moments where he makes me crazy. I love him, for example, on Hollywood Squares. <laughs> he uh, he does great work. Question for you before we analyze. The 1983 version we talked about in the opening, was that with Price too? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know why the huge gap from 74 to 82, but they got around in the early 80s. Let's do some more. Hollywood Squares. Wow. He was very booked. <laughs> very, very busy. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about here. Let me tell you the story of how I came to choose this episode. Yeah. For quite some time, I wanted to go back and get another Price of Fear episode. And when I was prowling around, I saw, oh, there's a one that features Peter Cushing. I love Peter Cushing, perhaps even more than Vincent Price, but, you know, I can't choose between my favorite horror guys. I'm really excited to listen to this and find out what it is. Uh, And I later told this to Joshua in a conversation he does not remember. Nope. (laughs) That I listened to it like, all right, uh, this is going to be great. And then it's a story of two guys talking over breakfast. And like, damn it, Vincent Price. <laughs> <laughs> like, tell me the story. Okay, you're eating breakfast. Good. That's all I need. That's how that, we're, we're doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> and then I told that to you. I said, well, we got to do that. Uh, I had given up on the idea thinking like, wow. it's just breakfast. Yeah. And I encouraged you to do it. Yes. Wow. I think there's only one solution here. I travel back in time now that I've heard it and tell you to bring it to the podcast. It's the only explanation. That's why I don't remember it, because I love that past forgetful me was right. (laughs) The opening to this, uh, I actually said out loud, train trips do fascinate me, Vincent. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me more. Tell me more. I... He leaves the door open. Do train trips fascinate you? If yes, then you're going to enjoy this. If someone said no, he'd be like, oh, should I just... (laughs) Should I head Let out the door? Look for my other scripts here and see if I got some of the boat rides. You like boat rides? <laughs> <laughs> Ponies? A little, little pony ride? I've told this probably on this podcast before, but l- trains and old movies and old time radio, mm-hmm. I love, 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 love them. I love those mysteries on trains, mm-hmm. and I just love it. So did you like his description? I thought it was really it was, well done. I thought it was great. I, I don't yeah. know if that was William Ingram who adapted it or if it's from Robert Arthur's story, but it's really nice. Yeah. Years ago, I finally got to take a very long train trip. I had been waiting. Let me tell you something. Greyhound is a much more enjoyable trip than a modern train. I disagree. Oh, I hated it. I hated it. It was a bunch of stinky people crammed into seats. and But you're on a train. Otherwise, it's a bunch of stinky people crammed on a bus. There's that. (laughs) You can move around uh, and there's further to walk. But the idea always in the movies and radio of eating in a train, I found this out very quickly. That's a bunch of nonsense. Your food goes everywhere. They don't have a lot... (laughs) They don't have a lot to choose from. They don't have a big kitchen. Mm-hmm. Maybe they did back in the day. But trying to keep it on that tiny <laughs> yeah. little table that you're crammed into, you it's impossible. They should just give you astronaut food right. that's designed it's for right. piping hot soup and jello. What, what flavor of gogurt would you like? <laughs> that's that's your choice. Uh, um, you know, it's the, the romanticism of it is really overplayed in the movies and radio. You're moving and shaking <laughs> all the time in a train. You're like, oh my God. And then when you get up to walk, I think I've told this story in this podcast. 
podcast, I was watching people walk down the aisle, you know, toward me. And as they're walking, it's going to be hard to explain, but, you know, you're constantly f- almost falling mm-hmm. over. You're and compensating. So you're, you're, and you're compensating and you're constantly grabbing seats and almost falling over. So I amused myself for two hours by everybody that walked on the aisle. I'd go, oh, 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 oh. and the people next to me couldn't breathe. We were laughing so hard because everybody was walking like Frankenstein. That was the best part of the train trip, yeah. period. But uh, yeah, I was on board at the beginning right there. One of my favorite things about this story is Vincent Price saying i've always considered conversation at breakfast something of a chore yeah, it's such too. a great line yeah. it's kind of true and vincent price delivers it so perfectly said everybody would ever done a bed and breakfast <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, i gotta have breakfast with these strangers and i love he describes his feelings were a mixture of resentment and dismay as he saw this little man sitting down <laughs> by him and so this allows you to interpret this story on two different levels. On one level, it's a very satisfactory sort of um, infidelity murder story. Mm-hmm. And on another level, on a more appealing level, it's just the story of Vincent Price's breakfast being ruined. <laughs> 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 and I love that. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I, I enjoyed it very much. That exact same thing of... For as much as my initial listen to it was indignant that this plot is just breakfast, <laughs> it was very fun, and I do love both Price and Cushing. At what point did you know what he had done? With the swimming pool? Mm-hmm. I missed it. There are so many clues, and I yeah. missed it. And so the second he said there was no water in the pool, I was you like, were sh- whoa. Oh, see, I love it when that happens to me. I don't like guessing. I don't like getting it because then it's much more fun. I should have guessed. As they, they went up and they dove off the diving board, it was very dark, and I went, there ain't no water in that pool. And I got it. But, but it was it, in that moment, right? I still think that's satisfying. It right? was it's, very satisfying. Okay. Yeah. Sixth Sense, you know, I had to have someone come in and go, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like I was not catching on and it was really fun. He's Kaiser Soje. Oh. <laughs> but uh, the- uh, Rosebud is his sled. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I always feel like that's the sweet spot of a reveal like that is the target moment to, for the audience to realize it is the second before that's said on screen. Yeah, and that's about when I got it, about 30 seconds before as he was yeah. describing it and I got it. It didn't take away though the idea that he hears the impact. <laughs> He's standing there and hears that impact and the guy jumped off the board second, which means that in midair, he heard the impact yeah. and mm-hmm. realized what was coming. They don't have to put terrible sound effects. You know, like Nightfall would put the sound effects of them <laughs> hitting the Shooting empty a cat pool. In the head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he just says, you know, I drained the pool. Mm-hmm. And there's no folio or anything because your mind does all the things that you just described. Yeah. Puts all the awful pieces together yeah. in that one moment. Yeah. Plus, it is so deftly foreshadowed in a way that doesn't give it away because there are reasons why they swim with the lights out because they don't want to be seen yeah. by the husband. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also just a glaring foreshadowing <laughs> of it when Vincent Price is looking at the picture of the wife and he describes the high diving the board, framed her head. It reminded me. Oh, yeah. Of a yeah. gallows. And gallows, yeah. Just thought, it's Vincent Price. I was like, of okay. course he's saying that. It's, it's <laughs> just, Vincent Price talk. Just got to get this out there. You're saying, oh, it was a nice piece of foreshadowing. If, did you listen to this twice? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every single piece of foreshadowing is followed by the train whistle. Oh, wow. I didn't catch that. So they said, it looked like a gallop. <laughs> like everything <laughs> was like, the train is trying to warn us. <laughs> <laughs> they could have had the train go, that's a hint. <laughs> Every single moment was uh, punctuated by the train whistle. Very so nice. So there was really getting beat over that. So I started to go, yeah, that's coming back. So we knew. And sometimes this works. More often than not, it doesn't work. But we know what's coming down Fifth Avenue. We know this guy got rid of his wife. What you have to decide then is, is the journey there, you know, Okay. And I really did enjoy the journey mm-hmm. here. Uh, I thought it was yeah. pretty it's fun. It's partially the writing. It's partially Cushing's fantastic performance mm-hmm. as Harry. And I still question exactly what's going on in Harry's mind in a good way. I'm not sure how much of his anxiety is real mm. or how much of it is a carefully 
constructed defense on his part. He's making a scene every time there's a potential scene by saying, I hate scenes, right? He's drawing all this attention to himself for someone who claims he doesn't like or want this attention. So it could uh, be real or it could be a setup. That's an interesting take. Yeah or, yeah, or how much was his original anxiety attack just to keep from letting her out of the house and going on the trip? Mm. And how much of it after the fact he found out about the chauffeur yeah. um, was continuing to be a little bit exaggerated. I was... In, in listening to his persona, he, he keeps presenting of like, I don't want to have any conflict. It kept foreshadowing for me that there's going to be some explosion, that it would mm-hmm. just be too far and he'd go nuts. And, yes. Um, mm-hmm. So it was right. really a chilling surprise. Yeah. I'm like, I just yeah. drained the pool. The man who hated yeah. scenes but didn't mind cleaning up the pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be a mess. I had an Eric moment that when this was sent to me by Tim and I see the title, I made the assumption and i don't know why it was about five minutes into it and went oh it's not that because of the title i thought it was about a man who hated theater <laughs> well, we know why you thought that uh, uh, like man who hated a little scenes. projection <laughs> <laughs> the man who hated scenes and i was like oh this is about a guy and something to do with yeah. theater and and i went oh right making a scene <laughs> i'm well, sure he hated theater as well yeah <laughs> The subtext is there. (laughs) Well, we haven't talked about one of my favorite transitions and what I think is a surprise moment is when we've spent this careful amount of time, maybe eight, nine minutes of just having the two voices of uh, Vincent Price and Peter Cushing and Cushing's character describing his wife as this, you know, Diana turned mermaid. (laughs) And then he says, Marilyn's outburst took me completely by surprise and then Bam, we hear this grating, obnoxious American voice, which is right. intentional and not at all when he's describing this goddess, not the voice we're imagining. Yeah, and, and the, it, the photo of this woman falling out of her bikini or what have yes. you, crawling out of the pool. A little too obvious, says Vincent <laughs> Price. <laughs> which they echo later, and they call the uh, chauffeur his looks. He's a little too obviously handsome. I thought that was a nice way to match them up. I had another empathetic uh, moment in this, or triggering, I should say, (laughs) moment in this. This is how I am in a restaurant. I am so terrified to create a scene about my food that you can bring me anything in a wrong order and go, that's fine. That's fine. And people be like, send it back. They don't mind. Now, please, please, please don't make a scene. Or this happened to me a few months ago where there was nothing on the menu that I could eat some fancy place and it was like all monkey brains or something i don't know and so i just said yeah i'm just not gonna eat and i tried to say I was, I'm, I'm just not hungry and everybody caught on brought the waiter who got the cook out who oh. or the chef and the chef's like no no it's not a problem everybody keeps saying it's not a problem i'm like it's a problem because i'm coming out of my skin and i've asked nine times but for this not to happen paying them and he made me a special dinner he goes what do you like and i this is what we call here in Minnesota Norwegian guilt. I can't take it. <laughs> I can't take it. So anyway, this empathetic moment. So the where... subtext here is your wife better not cheat on you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it's it's that gamble of is this chef going to be someone who like I'm not going to be happy till I get you the food you want it. and I'll be satisfied, or is it like? What does this jerk want from me? That's what I keep thinking, that they're thinking about me. Like, even if I ask for another fork, I'm like, okay. The other thing is, I'm terrified that they just go, hey, everybody, get over here, spit in this. Everybody (laughs) spit in this. This guy, you know. The reality is, hey, let's spit in this some more. They've already (laughs) spat in it. (laughs) At least you're getting food you want with spit in it. And I'm done eating up. (laughs) (laughs) I work in food service. I can tell you a few things. Uh, I just do not like creating a scene myself. It takes a big hill for me to die on. There is a live chicken in this soup. <laughs> you know what? Shh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other thoughts do you have on this? I am in love with the way this ended. Like the last lines from Vincent yeah. Price when he says, the man watched me waited and there's just oh, tense yeah. moment he's told the story what's going to happen and then when the train just goes into the tunnel and yeah. says it was like the fall Long of a curtain. curtain i thought it was great i yeah, love that ending end scene <laughs> <laughs> oh wait the man hates scenes <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was great and i love being left 
with this awkward moment. I mean, <laughs> Vincent Price is just, can I eat my breakfast now, <laughs> right. please? I had a moment when it was taking so long when they went through the tunnel. I mean, it's, it's about 20 seconds of going through tunnel. Mm-hmm. I thought that they were going to come out and he was gone. Like the guy told him the story and then in the darkness yeah, of the tunnel I, I thought so too, but I was much happier with that. Yeah. What does Vincent say to him at this yeah. point? Knowing Vincent, it's like, it's like fascinating. <laughs> Let me tell you about the time I killed my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I owned a wax museum once. <laughs> <laughs> and a house on a haunted hill. <laughs> well, uh, any other thoughts? Uh, I do in my in my dreams have a version of this that exists with all the eating noises added to their conversation just um, 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 no, God, so sauce. <laughs> you know that's one of my biggest pet peeves is being able to hear people eat their food either live I you know mm-hmm. like in person or if I can hear it on a movie or a radio or a TV show like I hate the sound of chewing <laughs> and the sound of kissing if you're going to kiss in a movie I don't want to hear the sloppy <laughs> movement you're a mess, Eric. <laughs> yeah. I got a lot of issues. What if there's a vampire sloppily <laughs> eating while kissing? That would drive you nuts. That would be the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. I'd be terrified and horrified and wouldn't With a clock ticking. <laughs> and a clock ticking. There We're doing is. a lot of callbacks to all of Eric's various phobias. If you don't know these, just go back through the catalog of podcasts. I have a lot. And you'll of, find out. Got a lot of issues. Got a lot of issues. <laughs> I'm doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> I made it this far. All right, let's vote on it, Joshua. Oh, I just love this. It's idiosyncratic, so I don't know that I can proclaim this a general classic, as in if you love audio drama, you must hear this. But for me, it's a personal classic. It, it definitely stands the test of time, I think. And uh, it's of historical interest, I think, in the way it blends 1970s British radio with classic old-time radio from America in the form of The Mysterious Traveler. They do a really good Um, job of... And I had no idea when I first heard this until it got to the end that this was by Robert Arthur. Arthur. Mm -hmm. I was like, is Vincent Price The Mysterious Traveler? I got really excited. (laughs) It totally reminded me of The Mysterious Traveler. Yeah. Um, Personal classic, great stuff. Thank you, Tim, for taking my advice that I don't remember (laughs) and bringing this to the podcast. That was everything that Joshua just said. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. I thought it was really well done. You know, Vincent Price was phenomenal. It's a great story. Uh, I like it a lot. That's all I'm going to say about it. Thank you, Tim. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I agree. I I, I don't know how to call it a classic, but it, it stands the test of time. It's an enjoyable performance by both of these actors who are, I love them both. And the story is a really strong one, well adapted from Robert Arthur's original. Yeah. Um, so much better than the other one you brought. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get a knife in. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. What was the other one? It was the, the octopus. Oh, the... that one. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that now. I could not make heads or tails about what was going on in that one. <laughs> So is the whole that was, squid on the ship now? That was that one, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and now that I think about it, it also, I think, had a fair amount of... <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> it's a lot of suction cup noises going on in that one. That was just Vincent Price eating. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, tell them stuff. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. It is the home of this podcast. You'll find other episodes there, including An Eye for an Eye, which was our very third episode. The first. But you one can skip it. <laughs> Uh, it's a great way to uh, leave comments on individual episodes. Send us a message, link to our social media, get a hold of us if you have episodes you want us to listen to. That's the way you do it. Yeah, you can also go to uh, patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. We love your support. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, great bonus stuff, extra content on the Patreon page, a monthly members only podcast, the Secrets of the Mysterious Old Radio. Uh, you can also go to iTunes and write a review. We love reviews and uh yeah you can go to facebook and join our discussion group the mysterious old radio listening group and uh where uh fans of the podcast and other old-time radio enthusiasts kind of dig in a little deeper and talk more about each episode as well as other fluffy stuff too and if you're in the area our theater group the mysterious old radio listening society does live reproductions of old-time radio classics alive on stage As Tim alluded to, if you're around, please come see us perform. We have a lot of performances. Well, at the time that we're recording this. (laughs) The old internet is endless. (laughs) 
and ageless. What are we listening to next? Uh, next time will be another listener request. It is The House and the Brain from Weird Circle. Until then... Look out! Just coffee and lightly scrambled eggs, please.